So hello and welcome to our podcast. And it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Leo Galant. He's a board certified internist practicing in New York City and who is recognized as a world leader in functional and integrative medicine and a pioneer in the study of intestinal permeability and the gut microbiome as they impact immune function and systemic health. So since the beginning of the pandemic, Dr. Galant has devoted most of the time to research on COVID-19 and to the education of other health practitioners in understanding the complex biology of the disease. Just recently, Dr. Gallan joined our board of medical advisors at the Long COVID Foundation. So Dr. Gallan, thank you very much for being with us. It's such a great honor to have you on our channel. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share this information, Valentina. Thank you. So today we're gonna have a very complex topic to discuss. So many of our listeners are waiting to hear about the damage that COVID can do to the brain. Um, many say that after COVID and long haul phase, people can no longer do things they did before simply because they don't know how to do them. So there have been studies in the UK that showed that COVID-19 has got significant impact on brain function and cognition. So we know that you have studied this research to understand this in details, and we would be delighted to hear from you where people's symptoms like forgetfulness, brain fog can lead to if nothing is done. So time is yours, please. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna share the screen. Okay, so I've, I've devoted a lot of thinking to the issue of what happens to the brain after COVID-19. Um, and there's been a fair amount of research, actually, that can guide us in understanding what happens, why it happens, and that suggests therapies that may be helpful. And one of the issues that got a lot of attention over the summer was the question of whether COVID-19 could actually increase the risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this was based in, on studies in people over the age of 60 that were done in the U.S. and that showed an increase in forgetfulness, which the part that's um, concerning is this was unrelated to the severity of, a co of acute COVID. That is, if someone is really sick, you know, they're in an intensive care unit, they're on a, a ventilator, we would expect that it's going to take time for that person to recover. But this involved people who had not been very sick. And even those who were hospitalized, which was a study from NYU, found that it, it did not require severe illness to, pro to produce an increase in markers in the blood that are associated with Alzheimer's disease. The University of Texas study of people who had not been very sick did find a relationship to loss of smell. And I think that's significant when we look at the two studies that you had referenced from the UK, which are very important studies. Um, one was made possible because of the UK Biobank database. Uh, there were 40,000 people who had had MRIs done of the brain shortly before the pandemic. And several hundred of them were offered the opportunity to get repeat MRIs several months into the pandemic. Um, and about half of them had had tested positive for COVID-19 and the other half had not and had not been sick. Um, and they were matched for age, sex, ethnic background and the interval between the scans. And those people who had had COVID-19 and then recovered, and most of them only 15 out of 394 had required hospitalization. So these were mild to moderate cases. When they looked at the group, there were changes in the MRI compared to the control group from before the pandemic to after COVID-19. And what those changes indicated was a loss of brain cells, gray matter, in certain parts of the brain and What's important about these parts of the brain are that they're involved in regulating some higher 
cognitive functions like spatial memory and complex decision making. They also are parts of the brain that are directly related to the sense of smell and taste. We know that the olfactory nerves, which start at the back and top of the nose, carry the sense of smell to the brain. And we know that the loss of smell is frequently a problem with COVID-19. So these nerves offer a direct route for the virus to enter the brain. Correlates with some, another UK finding with, in which um, neuropsychiatric testing was done online, tests of, of higher brain function with thousands and thousands of people, actually 84,000 people in the UK did this. Some of them had had COVID-19, some of them hadn't. And in this case, they matched people for their age, their gender, their education level, their income, um, pre-existing medical disorders, and their racial or ethnic group. Uh, and they found that when they compared the people who had had COVID-19 with people who had not had COVID-19, there were multiple areas of cognitive function that were impaired. And it was most pronounced on tests that assessed verbal problem solving and visual selective attention. Now, if you think about it, spatial memory is related to visual selective attention and um, problem solving that is cognitive, making complex cognitive decisions is related to verbal problem solving. So these areas that were damaged by the presence of COVID-19 are showing up in this testing as being functionally impaired. Now, there may be other types of cognitive problems that people experience after COVID-19 and that they describe as brain fog. But the ability to make complex decisions and um, to be oriented in space are certainly two important um, aspects of what is impaired when people talk about brain fog. Um, so the, the data su suggest that what happens with COVID-19 is that the virus directly gets into the brain and produces abnormalities in the brain. Now, these abnormalities are very different from what occurs in the lungs. Um, even after a mild infection, there can be damage to important cognitive centers of the brain and they may persist for some time. Um, this is one of the most historically concerning things. The 1918 influenza pandemic, there were epidemics of neurologic disease that occurred uh, and they were, um, became well known about 30 years ago with the um, publication of Oliver Sacks's best-selling book, Awakenings and a movie of the same name, same name, which starred Robert De Niro and Robin Williams, somebody who had developed this encephalitis after the uh, flu pandemic of 1918. The concerning thing is that there were new diagnoses of flu-based brain disease that occurred for a decade after the pandemic. And the peak of the new diagnoses was four years later. So we don't know if the post-COVID cognitive decline is gonna show a similar pattern. And if we are only seeing the beginning of what this virus um, can do to the brain. Now, when COVID-19 affects the brain, the inflammation that's produced is very mild and the number of viral particles is very low. As I said before, this is very different from what we see in the lung where there are a lot of viral particles and there's really robust inflammation. The response in the brain is that the brain actually just loses nerve cells, neurons. They just drop out through a process that's been called apoptosis. It's a very quiet cell death. There's not um, a major encephalitis or a strong inflammatory response 
It's just gradual and subtle. There is a solution to this kind of low inflammation apoptosis, loss of brain cells. So does it mean that the damage that COVID does to the brain and cognitive function itself is reversible? 